But Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so thankful, Lord. We're so thankful that you picked up those pieces and put us back together, Father God, and created us in a new creation, Father God. Holy and righteous and blameless before you, Father God. Equipped and empowered, Father God, to be the ambassadors that you called us to be, Father God. Lord, tonight we're just we're crying out, Father God, that you would season my tongue, Father God, to deliver this message message that with power and with passion, Father God, that, that can clearly communicate what you're trying to communicate to not only this body of believers, but the, the, the church at large, Father God, those people that are in these different countries that listen to us, Father God, Lord, we cry out for them, Father God, we cry out for us, Father God, that the ecclesia would draw together, Father God, to, to glorify you with our lives, Father God, that we choose every every circumstance, Father God, that we would choose to glorify you. And so, Lord, have your way in this place tonight, Lord. Do something that only you can do in the hearts and the minds of the people here and on the internet, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise Jesus. You can go ahead and be seated if you like, and as we transition into the preaching of your of the word, you know. Um, it's interesting. Uh, the Lord had me had me start right off right off the rip, Greg, with a question. You know, it's how many how many know that they're speaking to the Lord when He asks you a question? It doesn't He doesn't He do that all the time? He, you'll be asking Him a question, and He'll ask you a question back. You know, and it's like, okay, Lord, <laughs> you know. And so he starts off with this question. What is the reality of the resurrection? What is the reality of the resurrection? Frankly, the reality of the resurrection is more than just confession. It's more than just confession. It's an exhibition. Many will say, well, the reality of the resurrection is our salvation. Okay. The reality of the resurrection is that Jesus overcame the enemy and the world and death. Okay. I get that. Some will say, well, the reality is that the resurrection is now that Christ, through Christ, we have a living hope. Okay. All that is true. But where I'm going tonight is, 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 is somewhat, somewhat different. Because I think for too long, we've used somewhat Christ, that Christianese. And, and it, it is a little bit of Christianese, you know. that the, we've, We hang our hats on that and go, well, you know, the, the resurrection is a living hope. Okay, let's go further. What's the reality of the resurrection in your lives? What's the reality of the resurrection in the lives of every believer? Because what we're going to see tonight as we work through the passage of scriptures and work through the, I, the message that I feel like the Lord has having, given to me, understanding, Jesse, that the same spirit that lived in the apostle Paul lives in you. It's the same spirit, Alex. Think about it for a minute. Many have questioned the resurrection. But when they do, they're confronted with some stuff. They're confronted immediately with the radical transformation of the disciples themselves. Think about it. Think about it. these guys within 50 days of Jesus dying, being buried, and raising, within 50 days, these guys were transformed from defeated, frustrated, hopeless, a hopeless group of individuals who were hiding behind closed doors into a confident band of Christian soldiers determined to win the war for the Lord at all costs. 
What the world happened? The resurrection. The, you know, Paul tells us in, in, in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 that, that the very power of the resurrection is coursing our veins. You, you know it, but do you know it? The re, what's the reality of that? What, do you, what, what is the reality of that that should be exhibited to the world? It's interesting because we look at, we look at Jesus' brothers and sisters. They thought he was absolutely crazy. We don't have the time to turn there, but if you ever read Mark chapter 3, you'll understand it. That his brothers and sisters, they thought he was crazy. They thought he was out of his mind. But it's interesting what happened after the resurrection. James, his half-brother, becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church. No one as James the just had, or, or had knees as camels. Were so calloused from praying. His knees were so calloused from praying and seeking, for all intents and purposes, his half brother. His other brother, Jude, wrote a book of the Bible. James wrote a book of the Bible. What happened? Why was there such a transformation? I think Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians. If you have a Bible, turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's so interesting when you begin really look at this. And, you know, we're not going to do it uh, entirely justice tonight, but it, hopefully it's going to um, provoke you. I'm in the provoking mood, Clarice. Is in verse 3, it says, For I deliver to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one point, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, his brother James. Then to all the apostles, last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me. You see, if Jesus was a sacrificial lamb, and he died for our sins and paid the sin debt for our sins. That's awesome. We are in right standing with, with God because Jesus' blood covered our sins. But if, if it stopped there, all we would be doing is waiting around for heaven. All we would be doing is waiting around for his third coming. That's all we would be doing. If there wasn't a resurrection, all we would be doing is waiting around for his third coming. It's interesting to me that the disciples were seemingly scared for their lives in one minute, and then the next minute, they were ready to lay him down. Just like that. We see it at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit ascends on them and they start speaking in tongues and the, the crowd is confronted with a question. And we're going to confront you with this question tonight. What does this mean? What does it mean? There's two questions that you're going to be confronted with tonight. Well, three, really, because what is with the reality of the resurrection is obviously, obviously the first one. The second one is, what does it mean? And we'll get to the third one here in a second. So the crowd was confronted with this question, what does it mean? And all of a sudden, Peter starts proclaiming the gospel message, the gospel and power. He proclaimed this, this power and this passion that rose up out of him that frankly was 
the power of the resurrection coursing through Peter. He says, men of Israel in Acts 22, or excuse me, 2.22. There you go, Darlene. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourself know, this Jesus delivered up according to the divine plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified him. I mean, he hit him right in the solar plexus, didn't he? Like, you crucified him. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosed the prangs of death because it was not possible for, it to be held, for him to be held. What does Peter do, though? He opens his mouth. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I'm not sure you're understanding what season we're in, but it's time to open our mouths. Now, it can be said, absolutely can be said that we're in the last days because the last days started at the resurrection, at the ascension, the last days started. But here's what I know. We're closer today than we were yesterday. Right? And from statistically telling us there's 5.6 billion people. If he were to come back today, we're going to bust the gates of hell wide open. So, Bobby, we got a little bit of responsibility here that we're not fulfilling. we got to open our mouths and speak boldly, as Peter did to the crowd that was quickly forming, confronting them with the truth of the situation and the question. Their question to him, what must I do? So we got these three questions. What is the reality of the resurrection? What does this mean? And what must I do? Days later, they're going about their lives, and God uses them to heal a beggar in a temple. At the temple gate, beautiful, they come through there, and they've been going through that temple. Listen, they, they were going about their lives, their daily routine. It was time for prayer, and they went to the temple to pray. But God interrupted their lives, interrupted their going. They probably passed this joker a hundred times. It's Joe the beggar. Everybody knows him. Right? The scene draws a crowd, causes every, because everyone knows Joe the beggar. He's been there for years now, right? Peter opens up his big mouth again, and wow, he confronts the crowd with a gospel message and gets arrested. You know those days are coming, right? You know those days are coming that to give testimony of what God's doing may get you arrested. It's the craziest thing to even be saying this in the United States of America. You think we're in China or in Iran or in Pakistan or whatever. But friends, the days are coming. If you can't see the writing on the wall, you need to open your eyes. God is calling his church, his, his ecclesia, to stand up and give a testimony. The, you know, how many times have we said, or have you read, or have you given testimony that we are saved by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony? Do you have a two-minute testimony that you can share at any one second? I love going around to when I take people around on uh, and, and, and show them what God is doing in the midst of ministry. And I love just saying, putting somebody on the spot and say, hey, listen, what's God doing in your life? Or what's God done in your life? Man, you need to be ready. You need to be ready right now to open your mouth and give testimony to the reality of the resurrection in your lives. 
Let's look at it in, in Acts chapter 4. Picking it up in verse 1, it says, and, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed. And the number of men came, about, be, men came to be about 5,000. So what was the outcome of opening his mouth? 5,000 souls were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because he chose to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to open his mouth and for all intents and purposes, we see get himself in trouble because of it. God is calling his church to be bold. <laughs> There's another one, Shannon. It's happening here. Yeah. I'm sitting in the service last Sunday and I'm looking around and there are feathers floating down as we're, and it's happening again right now. That's right the second. Thank you, Jesus. In verse 5, it says, On the next day, the rulers and the elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Ananias, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. So Peter stands up there. He's in front of these jokers that basically have his life in their hands. And he gives testimony of Jesus of Nazareth. One of the issues that we're having in the United States right now is good people won't do good things. Too many good people are just standing by silent. Too many good people aren't doing the very things that God is calling us to do because we're scared. We're scared that we're going to lose something. How can we lose something when we've already gained everything? Do, you really, do we really believe what the word says? Do we believe it? Is it something more than an actual uh, intellectual exercise? Verse 13, he says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. They had recognized that they had been with Jesus. I can't tell you what that passage of Scripture has meant to me in my life. Many of you have heard my testimony of how I didn't feel like I was qualified to do what God has called me to do when he called me to do it. And the Lord spoke this verse to me. At the time that, I, that he spoke this verse to me, I was uneducated. I was as common as they come. But I had been with Jesus. 
have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? Because if you have, the reality of the resurrection should be coming out of here. It should be exhibited. We can't be, we can't be passive anymore. We can't be silent anymore. This world needs good people to do the good deeds we've been called to do in the scriptures. Not to intentionally be offensive, but we will offend. We don't, you, you don't set out to offend somebody, but because you pray for somebody, because you say, no, that's not right. No, this is not the way God wants it. You're going to offend somebody. But seeing the men who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they confronted, they conferred with one another, saying, Oh, there it is. What shall we do? What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. They can't deny it. And guess what? Neither can the world. Neither can the world. That, that, that lady, that, that although she may not even know Jesus or proclaim Jesus, she can't deny that her MS is gone. See, people can, they can argue and argue this word all day long, but they can't deny what God has done in your life. They can't argue what God has done in your life. They can't argue that you were underneath a bridge two years ago, but today you have life and hope. And God is using you, not only working in you, but he's working through you. Because God loves to take what's broken and put it back together and make it new. He loves it. Verse 17, but in order that they, it, it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. And so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, here's the thing. You have to, we have to understand this. Listen, you can speak in the name of Allah. You can speak in the name of Buddha. And none of it's offensive to people. But by golly, you speak in the name of Jesus, and it pokes people. It does. I wonder why. Because there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Is that power, the resurrection power that raised him from the dead, that's supposed to be coursing your veins, is it coming out in reality in your life? Or do you confess it, or do you exhibit it? My prayer is that you exhibit it. So they called him in and they charged him not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered them. I love this answer. I love it. I would encourage you to memorize it. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak what we have seen and heard. Think about what you've seen and heard just tonight in the testimonies. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. 40 years are, are, you know, thereabouts. This man had struggled as a paralytic, was hopping around praising Jesus, and everybody knew him, Joe the beggar. I don't imagine he cared too much about, right? 
that that leg that popped out and grew, Nikki, I don't imagine she really cared. Just, I'm not in any pain no more. Right? Prayed for a shoulder of a guy last week, and, and uh, it was so interesting because it was like, you know, when you pray for people, you need to keep your eyes open because oftentimes you'll actually see the hands of the Lord working. I literally seen the hands of the Lord grabbing his shoulder and realigning his shoulder to where there's no pain anymore. It, it was, a, I mean, it was amazing to watch, you know. It's the first time I'd seen something like that, but it was pretty cool of watching him actually work. You know, when, you get, when you're praying for somebody's spine, and Lord, just take your big old hand down their spine and just begin to align it. You see their spine going like this. It's, it's amazing to watch him work. But will you pray those prayers? Will you pray them out loud? Will you be bold for Christ? They took note that they were uneducated, common people, but they had been with Jesus. You see, folks, the reality of the resurrection is more than just a confession. It's an exhibition. Some would say, well, you know, Peter had a big mouth and was always getting himself in trouble. But what about Stephen? What about Stephen? He wasn't even in one of the 12. He was just a lonely churchgoer anointed. Churchgoer, right? In chapter, uh, in chapter 6, pick it up in verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen, as it was called, and of the Serenes, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Silica and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand his wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. You know, Stephen goes ahead and he tells them all about themselves. He gives them a history lesson. In verse 54, we pick it back up. He says, now, when they had heard these things, they were enraged. And they started grinding their teeth at him. He put, uh, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The interesting thing is, is that we realize who Stephen was dealing with by two succinct statements in this passage of Scripture, they ground their teeth. If you've ever done any, seen them, any type of demonic activity and how the demonic ground their teeth. Anybody ever been around a wild hog? Where they start chomping and grinding their teeth? It, it reminds me of the spirits that Jesus cast into the pigs, Right? They started grinding their teeth or stopping their ears up. I've been ministering to people where they put their, put their hands over their ears like this so they couldn't hear what was being said. You tell them, hey, move your hands from your ears, and then they go like this and stick their fingers in their ears. Because they can't stand to hear the word of the Lord. Stephen wasn't dealing with just flesh and blood. He was dealing with principalities, demonic activity. And the reality of the resurrection is more than just confession, it's action. It's action. We should be living it out on a daily basis. I mean, seriously, what do you think, you know, Jesus just didn't come to take all those stripes 
to hang on a cross just for us to wait until we took our last so we would be with him. He's with us right now. He's empowering us to have a life, right? We said, you know, part of the reality of the resurrection is the living hope. Well, the living hope is now. It starts now. I mean, it started when your salvation, but hopefully you're beginning to realize it and live in it now. You see, friends, the reality of the resurrection in a believer's life is so much more than just confession. It's transformation that comes of the exhibition. We see this transformation in the life of a man who absolutely hated Christians in the life of Saul. In chapter 9, verse 1, it says, But Saul was still breathing threats and, and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogue at Damascus. And so that he found any, any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground. And although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. You see, here's the thing is that in primary, and I, it sounds like I'm really being hard on the Western church and, and I kind of am. We've, we've, we've sold this bill of goods that all you got to do is walk an aisle, say a prayer and everything's okay. Just wait around for heaven. To, and then, you know, that's not... Christianity, that's not, that's not being in Jesus. That's not making Jesus the Lord of your life. That's getting a get out of hell free card. That's all that is. And I'm not sure whether it's actually, whether you actually got to get out of hell free card, to be honest with you. Because if there ain't any transformation, If you're not trying to exhibit what you've gotten, just saying. Paul so radically transformed that he arguably wrote half of the New Testament. So radically transformed that literally Two-thirds of Europe can be directly traced back to his ministry. I mean, and the same Holy Spirit, Jason, is living in you. Friends, we got to open our mouths. We have to open our mouths. The reality of the resurrection needs to come out of our mouths. It needs to be exhibited on a daily basis. Well, we hold back. You know, I'm sure you've probably heard this, and I know many other pastors besides myself, I probably stole it from them. But how I roll is I give credit once, it's like I've heard before, and then it's like I've always said after I've used it three times. So here it is. This is like I've always said. If you had the cure for cancer, would you keep it to yourself? Or would you tell somebody? Well, friends, what do we, what do we got a hold of here? I love how Peter puts this in 1 Peter 3. It says, Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Now think about it. What can they do to you? What can people really, really do to you? Listen, a long time ago, I made it right with me and, uh, you know, death. That was even before I was a Christian. I remember a guy telling me one time that he was down in Brazil doing, you know, work on a on a uh, missionary project and you know sometimes when you're on the mission field some of the equipment that you use is not the quote unquote safest it's not osha approved so to speak and so uh he's he's you know the guy's saying well you know yeah get up on that ladder and you go up there and you do this and and he looks up there and he goes 
I'm not doing that. And the guy's response was, well, you're saved, aren't you? <laughs> now, hear me. It's not that we'd be flippant about our, our, our you know, um, our life, because God has given our life to be ambassadors for him here on this earth. But when we're doing that work, he's right there with us. In verse 14, he says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be doubted, or troubled, excuse me. But in your hearts, Honor Christ, the Lord, as holy. Well, there it is right there, isn't it? There it is right there. But in your hearts, honor Christ. Is that where he is yet? Is he, is he in your heart? Is this whole gig in your heart yet? Or is it just still academic? Is it still intellectual? See, the power of the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection is exhibited into the world. That's why he's given us this power to reconcile who? The world. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that you have. But don't forget this last little part. Because it's important. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. We don't go out there to set out to offend people. Now we're going to, what we say can be offensive. But we need to be confronting the world in, gen in, in gentleness and respectfulness. But we need to confront them. No longer do we need to come back, folks. It, it, it's, it's time, you know. I mean, I almost want to do the whole, you know, it's time. Let's get ready to rumble, you know, type thing. Because that's where we're going. I mean, this is, this is the season that we're moving into. God is calling his ecclesia to step up. So like several of the crowd found in the book of Acts, you are confronted with very two important questions tonight. What does this mean to you? What does the reality of the resurrection mean to you? Well, first and foremost, it means that you haven't, if you haven't experienced the reality of the resurrection, what you waiting on? You've already had the personal invitation. You're missing out the very reason Christ was raised from the dead for you. There's so much more than just salvation. There's an invitation to join him on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. There's an invitation to join him at, at his work first, of course, in you, because there's, you're co-laboring with the Lord in your life. But then, secondly, you're co-laboring with the person that are in your center of influence. God is joining. He, 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 he's He's wanting you to join him at your work. Or at his work, excuse me. There's an invitation to join him and allow his, the reality of his resurrection to be exhibited to the known world. Your known world. Because your known world is different than my known world. It's different than Shanna's known world. It's different than Greg's known world. Just by sharing that testimony of what God has done in Greg's life to his daughter, we give her testimony tonight. What do you think God's doing there? Oh, I know what he's doing. He's drawing her. She may not even know it yet, but he's drawing her. He's drawing her into a relationship, not only with her, physical, or with her earthly father, but he's drawing her into a relationship with her heavenly father too, all at the same time. What shall we do? What are we going to do? Are we, are, are we going to you know, stand to our feet at the end of the service and pray a prayer? 
and go and, you know, and hang around and, and fellowship. And that, man, that's part of it, right? Fellowship. We love you guys and you love us. And, we're, you know, we're community. 10, 15 minutes are going to go by and somebody is going to ask, where are we going to eat? It's going to happen because I'm hungry. I'll probably ask the question. But what are we going to do when we go out the door? Are we going to forget what the Lord's doing here tonight? Are we going to forget what he's already done in our lives? No, he's calling us to act in boldness for the kingdom of God is at hand. Go, go, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. If you got the Holy Spirit in you, you can do all that and more. Jesus said, right, even greater works than him we're supposed to be able to do. That sounds like a challenge to me. I love challenges. I don't know what is there. There's probably 30 people in the room tonight because it's silly season and everybody's at Christmas parties. But just think if we got a hold of this thing and started exhibiting the resurrection to people in our lives, just in our center of influence, what's the ripples that go on into eternity from that? This isn't a game, friends. <laughs> Go oh, make disciples. Are you making a disciple? Well, I'm no pastor. Oh, praise the Lord. I didn't see that as a qualification to make a disciple. Everyone should have a Paul and everyone should have a Timothy. Every one of you. I don't care if you just give your life to Christ yesterday. There's somebody that, that you can get to give your, their life to Christ two weeks from now. Guess what? He's your Timothy. She's your Timothy. You've got two weeks on them in the faith. Don't let them surpass you for crying out loud. Too many of that going on. Make disciples, instructing them in which you've been instructed. And go from there. The world is looking for the church. Give them a reason for the hope that you have. Do you have hope? I hope that you do. Because you're supposed to have the king of hope. He's your Lord. You're supposed to have the hope coursing your veins in the Holy Spirit. But what are you doing with it? Is the reality of the resurrection gone to waste? Or is it fixing to be unleashed? And the gates of hell will shake. Sign me up for that. Sign me up to get so stinky. You know, here's the thing. I, I used to be one of those people that were, were, were really pretty reserved as far as my worship and probably still am to a lot of people. But I read a book called, um, uh, I think it was Jar by Charles Finney, um, Lectures on Revival. And it talks, and Paul talks about this too, where, you know, start stirring yourself up. Start stirring yourself up to get excited about what God is doing in and through your lives. And what's somebody going to say? Oh, you're a bad Christian? Oh, your poor little heart won't get hurt? Stop. There are people that are going to break hell wide open. There are people that need to hear what God has done in your life. They need to hear it. They need the freedom that you're experiencing. Hopefully you're experiencing it. So here's how we're going to end tonight. If you'll stand to your feet. Jesus. I just want to, ch I'm challenging you. It's like a double dog, triple dog challenge, right? Challenging you to go out and live the reality of the resurrection in your life. So that next week in prayer time, there'll be like every one of you want to stand up and give testimony of what God did through your lives or in your lives or through your lives next week.
Are you going to wimp out on me, James? No wimps allowed at Christianity. We've got to be bold for the Lord. So let's pray. Lord, we're, we're praying tonight, Father God. Lord, we, we, we've seen the reality of the resurrection, Lord, through the scriptures. We've seen the reality of the resurrection through the literally thousands of years that you have worked through humanity, Father God. And so, Lord, tonight, we pray, Lord, for empowerment to walk in that reality, Father God. That, that this is, that how we uh, are walking, will walk, and will continue to walk, Lord, is more of a reality than what the world is, Father God. Lord, that we would choose to join you at your work, wherever you are, in whomever you are, Father God. And that we would open our mouths boldly, proclaiming your gospel message, Lord. That we would do it in gentleness and with respect, Lord. So, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, your Holy Spirit over each one of these people today, Father God, that as they leave this place, Lord, that you would give them a continual sense of your presence in their life, Lord. And that they would move in and through and around being inspired by your Holy Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.